welcome to this session on uh, instant multi-cloud and how to make it happen. Uh, does anyone, I guess, who thinks that's a, a major clickbait title? <laughs> I love it. Well, at least we got your attention, right? Uh, I, I'd rather you be in this session than another one. That's, that's the fact. Uh, so um, uh, let's get started. Um, this is kind of what we'll cover today. Uh, there is going to be a demo. Uh, we're going to try to not inundate you with more than roughly 10 uh, to 12 minutes of slides uh, and then walk you through what this could look like in a very simplified manner. Um, I don't think... Um, if, you, if you have already experienced OpenShift in the cloud, Kubernetes at all, that you'll have any sort of mind-blowing moments through this presentation. But what we're showing you is the art of the possible um, with the fact that you can throw uh, two of our managed service offerings together uh, in different clouds and achieve some very interesting results. So we will cover who we are. Um, why multi-cloud multi may or may not be good for you. Um, some things you might encounter that uh, you know, could be qualified as speed bumps on the way to trying to do something like this. And things that um, might entice you or disentice you from doing this at all. Uh, this may not fit everyone. Uh, as with many things with cloud architectures, it might be good for you, might be bad for you, depending on what part in the journey you are. Uh, for adopting cloud in general. Um, if I'm not mistaken, our talk might be the least hybrid cloud of this conference and the most cloud native. Uh, and I'm not trying to be special, it's just that this fits a different customer profile than what Red Hat, I think, normally would be uh, nudging people towards. Uh, we'll cover kind of a, a short part in here about um, some progress patterns, which will cover sort of a timeline or you might be able to identify where you see your org uh, in uh, making progress towards a multi-cloud architecture. We'll cover um, the architecture itself that we're describing in the demo. We'll do the demo itself and summarize and hopefully have some time for Q&A. We have a, a good bit to cover though. Uh, so Jerome. Yep. So nice to meet all of you. My name is Jerome Buto. I've been at Red Hat for about 10 years and I'm focused on Azure Red Hat OpenShift. Also, fun little fact that I like to climb rocks and I cannot stop eating Nutella, so. <laughs> and my name is Aaron DeYoung. I'm a product manager for Rosa. I've been with Red Hat for uh, about two and a half years now. Uh, I am not a Boston local, um, but um, I do like Nutella. And the one thing that I think we share in common is that um, not just Nutella, but we happen to speak French. Uh, but I don't think we'll be doing any of that today. <laughs> so. Um, why would we want to use multiple clouds? Let's get right into it. So um, everyone will have started their journey with one cloud over another. You more than likely have a specific set of strengths in that first cloud that you dove into. You will have secondary clouds that will feel very foreign the first time you dip in to the second cloud. Ideally, by the time you've reached your third cloud, it's all fair game for you and you've mastered the art and you don't need to be here listening to us. But um, at least under, you know, prepare yourself for the fact that it may be a slight shock to find out that things differ between your clouds. Um, but other reasons why you might use more than one cloud at the same time is to take advantage of the simple things, special features, uh, strengths related to... Um, particular sizing of instances that might fit your workload really well. Uh, in other cases, it's about um, expanding your map of resilience. Uh, you, you currently might look at a singular cloud or your private cloud as having just, um, you know, you've got your region and you've got your availability zones. Those are your three f failure domains. Now, you could argue you could expand that uh, sort of capability to accommodate failures to a point where if you have enough failure domains and you know how to fail across them appropriately, you might not even feel them at a certain level of scale. Now you could argue this could be for very large customers uh, or for startups that are doing this fresh and throw you know, fresh talent at it. But I think nonetheless, it's interesting to think that once you reach a certain level of scale, there is a lot that you can accomplish. 
Um, and then other reasons why you might use, use multiple clouds is something as simple as acquisitions. Um, you, some people want to uh, go based on technological preferences, whatever have you. Let's, let's be honest, that's what drives sometimes a lot of those choices. Uh, any, anything you want to add? I mean, and obviously the commitment you have with a cloud provider. Sometimes you commit to your committed spend and you're going to get discounts based on that. And because of that, you're going to decide this next workload or maybe a lot of my workloads need to go somewhere. And then the decision can change. Like, it's not because today you make a choice to go somewhere that tomorrow your next decision couldn't be somewhere else. Um, the, um, I, I kind of like the analogy I've, I, I've heard from someone once regarding single cloud. Having single cloud for forever is a lot like eating at the same restaurant when more than five you know, are within walking distance you know, or on the same block. You're, you're probably missing out if you're sticking to just one cloud. Um, and, and some interesting stats among many, 70% uh, of orgs are now at least multi-cloud. And that includes hybrid, which is good news. Um, but um, that's a relatively high number, especially given that it was a small grouping of customers. Um, Onward, so uh, why it might not be good for you. Do you, do you want to go ahead? Yeah, with so like you know, we're talking about why you would, but the reality is, like, actually, let's take a poll. How many people are using multi clouds today? Bravo. So that's good, and some people are, but it's, it's a minority. The reality is, there's some complexities there. From an infrastructure standpoint, you have to learn about all the clouds. Uh, you may have different teams that have these expertise. That's going to take time to acquire that knowledge. Uh, there's, there's, there's also areas of um, lock-in, but also flexibility that comes with multiple clouds. So like you, you use multiple clouds, you want that flexibility, but you might already have that lock-in today because you have a commitment with the cloud. And based on that cloud, your, your operational excellence is going to be a single cloud. In the future, you may want to have more than one, but you haven't been able to, to expand on that area. And, and the other part that's, that sometimes is operational. So you may have the vision of being able to go to multi-cloud, but how do you get there? Where do you start? How do you think about it? Where do you, where do you think of like, which team are gonna start going to that, that journey? Because it is a journey, you have to learn about the environment. And so sometimes that causes teams to just say, you know what, this is too hard to start today. Even if sometimes regulators may say, you need to have multi-cloud options, but the reality is it may not be something you can do today. So have patience. Um, this is the type of journey where you may be locked in due to, to things like compliance. Um, and the fact is, you may never unearth from that original cloud to move to more than just one. Um, I would say any org maybe in the, within the next 10 years is, it would be probably, I think we could say, it would be a surprise that they wouldn't be in more than one cloud within that time. And I think the one thing that is common every, from everyone I've at least spoken to just at Summit so far is that they are looking at more than just their private data center now. And, and so that tells me that the moment you make that step from private data center to the next cloud or even your first, you're effectively doing multi-cloud at that point. So could it be for you? Are your staff willing to expand their skill sets? This is a fair challenge everyone will need to fight with. Um, if your current org is not ready, what will it take to make that happen? Um, it's, it's ideal to skill up your staff, not just for them to want to stay because you've invested in them, but so that they can reinvest back into your company. Um, would existing silos slow down adoption? That's, I think everyone is battling with silos one way or another there will be a convincing period where you've got um, a, a silos that are not bought into doing cloud at all. I think the best way to, make, to, to show that there is success that will convince these teams is to have at least one team that has done it um, even in a POC format initially. That will give everyone kind of the hints that they need to realize, hey, that there's something to this and there's a lot to gain from going beyond just our private data center, going to cloud, and then making that step to secondary cloud for all the benefits you can reap. Do you need scalability and capacity? Who, does anyone here not need scalability and capacity at this very moment in their org? 
it's okay. I, I'm, I'm really happy you guys didn't raise your hands on that one. <laughs> but that's the easy answer for most orgs. That's why we're all at this whole conference, I think. There's so much cloud coverage, but this is about gaining scalability and capacity beyond where you're most comfortable. And dare I say, in some cases, um, we can look, in, look within oneself sometimes and say, perhaps complacent. We should try and reach beyond that and get to a point where we can leverage more than the tools that we're already comfortable with. Uh, anything? Yes, the other thing to keep in mind is when you do go on this journey, be aware that at least at the beginning, there's going to be a learning experience that will take place. And so that initial team that has to figure out, take the, the, the approach, figure out how this other cloud works, may take a little longer. But that cost, the initial cost, is worthwhile because future adoption will be made easier. Um, absolutely take, in, take into consideration that um, one cloud will have a certain set of compliances, another one will not, and may be the reason why you've not yet jumped over there. Go and communicate with, with them, because the fact is, uh, if, if, um, if your workloads make sense to be in multi-cloud multi architecture or across more than one cloud at all, um, every cloud is willing to take your business, as we all know, but the fact is, is um, if no one knows that you're trying to do it, no one will try to help you do it either. So take advantage of the relationships that you can forge, even just in this ecosystem of this conference alone, and find someone from a cloud that will help you on your journey, even in, even in those first few steps. So it is easy to have your hands full. Um, different tool sets. Um, we've got so many options with Service Mesh today, it makes my head spin. Um, there is a cost to being, to having this much variety of options. It almost causes decision paralysis, as, as we may already be familiar with, just in a singular cloud. Um, we at Red Hat always would argue that the, the development tool set will always matter. You should always ensure you've got a consistent experience for developers. Um, there's been always this huge focus on operations, but the developers that put those apps live are, you know, their lives matter as well, absolutely. Are there any devs at heart in the room? Good, I'm glad there's some representation. And uh, th the fact is, is um, it's difficult to adopt new clouds if there is a diversity of tools. OpenShift is always pushing for that fact that it's got the consistent experience, and wherever you can abstract away the underlying cloud's differences, that, that would help teams with adopting a multi-cloud architecture. Um, some of the other, one, other ones here are very obvious. There are an, unique new sets of training and certification to deal with, but it might sometimes even, in, even regards to certifications or training, get some initial training. Some teams might, be, uh, might not have the taste for saying, oh, I've been, I've been uh, certified in AWS already. Why should I certify in Azure now? Well, the fact is you can train up to near that cert, but the investment to the cert itself, maybe find out when that's important for you rather than um, investing in it right away. Um, gaining the knowledge now is great, but it may change by the time your teams are ready to actually certify. Uh, anything else? I think uh, you covered quite a bit of like the complexities that you might perceive initially until you get going. Yeah. Um, so some goals to aim for, and some of these are absolutely uh, maybe a little bit hand wavy, and in some cases um, uh, we have still found with interactions with some customers um, are, are not quite as common sense as some of us think who work, in, work with it on the day to day. Um, we would say um, to avoid decision paralysis, look for a consistent platform, hint, hint, nudge, nudge, right? Um, Kubernetes and automation together uh, will address uh, infrastructure complexity by abstracting it. If you're already working with Kubernetes, congratulations, you've abstracted infrastructure enough so that you can get applications in the cloud. Now, we're gonna argue through our demo you can take it a step further. Um, are there any others you want that are not there, but? Maybe? I mean, some, some of this is, is like, you should, you should set a goal for the initial team. So th I think of this as a like goal setting, like you want to learn about the infrastructure, learn about the, the environment, what are the important components that you want to have to be the same, and which ones you're willing to be different. And going back to what we were talking about 
earlier, what are the things you want to take advantage of in each of these clouds? Is it about the services that are unique in this cloud? Is it about the ecosystem? Is it about the instance types? Whatever these things are that you think are important, make that list that you identify these as the things that you need to learn about as you start that journey. If you have access to a turnkey platform, um, thousands of hours have been invested into making it work, run, and operate. Take advantage. That is the beauty of the open source platforms that have been built uh, and put together, take advantage of turnkey platforms. You may not be looking at you know, Rosa or ARO right away, but if you can get used to and get accustomed to running AKS, GKE, and, and, and EKS all in you know, symphonic fashion, you're one step closer to um, honestly being right, right away multi-cloud right there and taking advantage of all the benefits that could be available to you. So beyond goals, um, I would just like to point out that Red Hat's presence in the primary cloud providers is essentially solidified at this point. I'm sure we can obviously always make some improvements, um, but uh, I think maybe there's some underlying uh, message with us making the on-premise one so tiny versus the logos, right? <laughs> um, but, but nonetheless, uh, you can trust in the fact that we have an OpenShift that can satisfy you in the three clouds uh, plus one. Um, here's where we're going to cover sort of the uh, cloud progress pattern. There's three slides here. Um, and essentially the pattern here is to get a look at where you might be on this journey. And uh, what you see here is there's this section way left where you see in the red, you know, where, when you're in your on-prem data center. And on the far right, you've reached second cloud. And in the, somewhere in the middle, you're in your first cloud part of the journey. Now, this is not, uh, by all means, a one-size-fits-all scenario. But it is something that we've observed some customers go through. And, and through a lot of data gathering, we can kind of figure out this tends to be what people hit and what some people trip on and some things where some people could improve. There are, so the three that I was talking about, there's the good, there's the rough, and there's the better. Um, the rough, I would like everyone to just have a quick gander and say, am I in any of these red blocks? The one that I think I want to pick on the most is the lift and shift. How many of you have heard that muttered in your org before? Did it bother you? <laughs> so it, I, I don't think it matters which partner I talk to. Um, or which customer I talk to, at the end of a lift and shift, everyone is generally unhappy. When you're doing a cloud, um, a multi-cloud progress sort of journey, if you will, um, ideally you don't do a lift and shift. Ideally. I admit that's a little hand wavy. Ideally you don't do a lift and shift. You need strong chops in automation and pipelines. You may already know this. Like I said, this isn't a mind-blowing presentation. It's kind of re-solidifying what we've seen and just sort of representing what we think everyone should try to aim for. Um, you've reached multi-cloud once you've done on-prem plus first cloud. Let's call it that. Let's give yourself a buzzword and you know, pat on the back. By the time you've hit second cloud, you've arguably hit cloud maturity because you've dealt with the abstractions of going from one cloud to the next. The benefits you see here, I think, um, speak for themselves in that some of, the, some of the stuff up top is about, you know, that serverless and innovation time, that's extra time that you've gained, uh, hopefully, as a result of not getting stuck in the cruft of what happens in this kind of timeline. I really hope none of you have to deal with the hell that could be considering reverting to on-prem. Um, if that's something that you did, that's fine. It may not be the journey for everyone. We're not going to scold you. But the fact is, is um, it would be horrible to have wasted all that effort. There's many ways to, to hopefully avoid that. Um, this whole crash and burn scenario um, could be worse, could be a lot better. Um, but I think, I think the, the message is relatively clear. Um, good is good but there's still no time for innovation because you're still busy with familiarizing by your second cloud. And better is better because, you know, 
let's be honest, you have two product managers from Managed OpenShift. We're, we're suggesting you get Managed OpenShift along the way. Mm -hmm. So we're honest here, but the fact is, if you've taken away the operational overhead, you've been left with the time to do other things, ideally. Do you want to speak to Divert? Well, I, I was just going to note something on the previous slide. The, thing, the beauty about OpenShift, it gives you that consistent platform. So you saw like the, the, the other patterns required to relearn every time you go to a different cloud. By using that consistent pa pattern, consistent experience, a developer can deploy the same application in one environment and then the next environment without having to learn new skills or minimal new skills. And so that gives it, that both accelerates the time to get to multiple clouds and also makes it easier to get there. Um, so uh, just in the interest of time, I kind of want to bubble over these really quick and get to our demo. Um, so uh, the fact that you're, you could use a managed platform to divert you know, operations burden from teams, I think everyone understands that there's a benefit there. Um, the whole point of this is we want to encourage that cluster provisioning. Putting a Kubernetes platform in the cloud should become boring. You might think, well, shouldn't it be exciting? For some of us who are hardcore nerds, yes, it'll always be exciting. Mm -hmm. You put a cluster of, of bits together that happen to make other bits work together. It's fantastic. But the act of provisioning multiple clusters and operating them should become back of the hand easy. Very quick, simple, boring. Because then you can focus on that innovation time and, and focus on making developers' lives easier. Um, some would argue multi-cloud needs a complex architecture. Not always. That is essentially the thesis of us getting to the demo. Uh, another item I just want to quickly harp on is um, think automation and pipelines instead of migration. If someone says migration, make that a bad word in your org. Migration is from the days when we had VMs to move between hypervisors. Cloud doesn't need that anymore. You've heard the terms um, cattle, not pets. This is that mindset and sort of um, culture shift that you need to perhaps encourage in your orgs for this kind of, of uh, scale adoption. Um, so next time you speak to your groups, your teams, um, and someone says migration, maybe say, hey, let's stop using that word here and, and then instead think of automating deployments, pipelines. Um, and for those that simply must be migrated, take it with a grain of salt, I guess. Uh, we're going to move on to our demo. Uh, we put it into video format because we understand the Wi-Fi here could be unreliable. But um, this is, in short, the as general sort of bubble-like architecture we can show you for what this is. Um, Essentially, it is uh, our OS toy application, which you may have seen other demos from Red Hat do, uh, that is deployed via a pipeline, which happens to be GitHub Actions. And it deploys our, its image to Quay. Quay then, upon deploying with the GitHub Action, sends the image to whichever cluster I want to deploy to. In the end, I've got any sort of solution here that can um, load balance the access to the apps across the three clusters. This is a very basic multi-cloud architecture. Could be adopted for some very simple applications and prove the point in a proof of concept to your org that this is indeed possible. And if Azure has a bad day or AWS has a region outage or Google happens to be doing something funny with DNS, I can rely on the other two clusters keeping my app up. Now, before this sounds too hand wavy, this kind of works better if you've got stateless applications, aka ones that don't need persistent volumes so that the persistence has to be synchronized across the clouds. That is still something that across the cloud providers is still considered relatively a dark art, replicating data between regions. This is why people sometimes come up with funny concepts like doing a stretched OpenShift cluster. I was reminded today. Um, these things are scary. Um, let's try not to encourage that kind of pattern. Um, let me move right to the demo here. I do want to put some thanks to the two gentlemen who helped us build the demo environment and prepared, a, prepared uh, the video with us so that we could show this to you um, 
exactly what it looks like. Uh, that's August Simonelli and Gaurav Mita. All right. Yeah, yeah. we go. Okay. So this is uh, the GitHub Actions pipeline. So the first part of the deploy is a GitHub Actions pipeline that is prepared for building and pushing to Quay, deployment to a Rosa cluster in a, that is considered the dev environment, and then later on uh, in the deployment uh, to a production Rosa environment. So this moves forward. And within a matter of seconds, um, you can move applications you know, in a pipeline fashion like this between multiple different um, clusters. So over here, this is the Rosa cluster that we're showing. Uh, and if in case the branding happens to go, in the way, go away on the upper left, we will show it in the OS toy application, which can tell which distribution of, of managed OpenShift we're running. Uh, you can also try to discern it from the URL if your eyes are 2020. So the developer application, now that it's uh, deployed, uh, it's on the way for being deployed, uh, we would trigger it by running the workflow in GitHub Actions. I'm going to push this just forward a little here. Uh, so here, it's building and pushing to Quay. That takes a couple minutes. I'm going to scrub it forward so that we're not waiting for the build to occur. But here, we're starting to see it, it show up on the Rosa cluster. The entire deployment, uh, I believe, is only two pods. Yes. And then you can see we've got a service. A route will be created open up the route, and you'll see the OS toy application show up. It's currently running on the Rosa cluster, so this is the dev or the prod environment. The same application is going to be pushed to production. So we're going to look at the production cluster. Here's where we're sort of doing a in GitHub Actions, you can do an approve and deploy. To the production environment, this is the Rosa prod cluster. The deployment is coming in as a result of the action right now. Here we go. OS toy comes in. Exact same application deployment. Here it is running on Rosa in the prod environment. Now, the next step is to kick it into ARO. I've decided um, my environment in Rosa is great. I want to take advantage of the fact that I recently procured ARO at a, some sort of discount. Maybe um, there was a sale. Uh, and then all of a sudden, I want to just plug it into the new cluster. And that would be going into the GitHub Actions pipeline. And you need to pre-authenticate that cluster with your pipeline. So that what you can do is do something like this, where you choose which cluster you're going to, put in your looks good to me, release it now, release the hounds, approve and deploy, and we're moving on to our ARO environment. That is this one here. After a few seconds, it shows up in the ARO cluster. Route shows up for it as well. We see OS Toy running on ARO, the exact same app deployed within mere minutes to three different clouds. We're at two so far. We will get to the third. Here's our GCP deployment. Same deal. Pick the cluster, put in the message that says things are going, and approve and deploy. This environment moves forward into Google Cloud. Here it is building. Route is created, and just there before we refreshed, there's our, our OSD app. So this is what this is OSD on GCP. We now have 
within minutes, and even though I was scrubbing, this whole video is only six minutes long, was recorded in real time. So you can effectively deploy the same app to three different clouds in an under 10 minute span. A little hand wavy, but assuming you have plugged in your pipelines to all the relevant environments where you want to deploy your app. Now there's always going to be that prep to take into account for, but the fact is I have a consistent OpenShift cluster in all three clouds, and I've deployed the app, and at this point, it's autopilot, and you leave it, you know, if, if we're going to throw some grenades over the wall, which is a faux pas, but it's a bit, it's a bit funny to use sometimes. Um, if the apps um, are running at this point, um, I'd love to see one cloud go down, and then suddenly I'm still live. You know? So as the load balancer refreshes, We'll see, start to see here um, that every time you refresh, we can sometimes see a different cloud every time. As you can imagine, this needs to be stateless again in order to accommodate something like this. If you want to go stateful, you have to engineer some sort of replication solution. But that is all three clouds behind the same um, sort of load balancer. And I believe in this case, they, used, they were using uh, front door. That's right. Front door as a gateway to direct to each of any of the clusters. You could use CloudFront, Cloudflare, et cetera, F5, um, and achieve the same thing. So nobody's mind should be blown. Everyone keep it together. Um, mm -hmm. Fact is, is we've exemplified that this is not witchcraft, a dark art. It's not incredibly complex anymore. I think it's safe to say in this day and age that uh, achieving multi-cloud is, um, is realistic. I'm just gonna bring back our presentation here. Yes. I think I know where you're going. It absolutely could. It's just another way of achieving it. You could have uh, Ansible event-driven automation do these deployments for you. You could have Ansible without event-driven automation do these deployments for you. You could have Ansible do this instead of GitHub. It's, it is up to some preference here, right? You're pointing, this is the simplicity of showing that you can do this um, by using, please, not the term migration, but by automating your deployments into pipelines or whatever have you so that you can get the same app deployed everywhere. Let's say this is something a little more weird and, and, and very weird, like OpenShift releases version five and everyone's like, oh, oh crap, what do I do now? Um, by the way, that's not happening as far as we understand. Um, it's not a matter of migrating to new cluster versions. It's a matter of redeploying with pipelines. So I think if anything, the major takeaway is if you're not comfy with automation and pipelines, that is your next step to getting into multi-cloud. I'm just gonna advance this forward to some other points that we wanted to cover here. Uh, we, did, we did cover this architecture a little earlier, um, but in its simplest form, this is what we've achieved. Getting your app from your end to the platform so that it serves your customers. Um, engineered correctly, avoiding um, migration as much as possible. Um, this is effectively what you can achieve just as well. Um, could it be as little as two clusters? Yes. Um, maybe you don't need the grand lavish scale of having three clouds under your arm and you simply need two clusters um, in different clouds for various reasons. Maybe there's certain GPU models that your app works better with on Azure. Maybe there's certain scale or network capabilities on AWS uh, that you need specifically for certain apps. Sure, but at the same time, there was always some apps that you could scale across multiple clouds um, and take and reap in the benefits. Um, any, you wanna add to this one? I mean, we obviously think OpenShift is a great solution, but if you don't go with OpenShift, there are other ways, but 
To Aaron's point, the pipelines really are the tool that's going to help you get there because it really creates abstractions. Then you can direct it wherever you want. Mm -hmm. um, I think at this point, I think the message is relatively clear. Uh, make migration your anti-pattern. Um, this is more of the art of the possible rather than what you've uh, currently dealt with regarding complexities. Um, I, I think we're pretty good with what we've covered and if we'd like to dive into Q&A, that's entirely fine. I'd love to. And there's some other talks from other members of the cloud services team I wanted to highlight as well um, that are worth visiting. Um, so I guess uh, if, if you, if you want to go, you can. But if you want to do some Q&A, we're open to that. Uh, in the corner. Uh, where are the load balancers running? You, you want to? Yeah, so that's using Azure Front Door, and Azure Front Door is a is a Azure service which uh, allows you to load balance into any of the clouds. So it's actually running in Azure, and then redirects to any of the 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 the, um, the clusters. Yeah, you would you you probably use something different. I mean, it can be as simple as DNS that just directs to different you know URLs, different places, or as complex as like some other load balancer that you can implement yourself. Yeah, if you're relying on the OpenShift routes, um, then they that is still each cluster has its own route that you're forwarding the end game load balancer to. Some people call this global load balancing. At some point, you need to choose one cloud or one service somewhere that will aggregate all of your um, endpoint clusters at some point. You may have an affinity to one cloud for a particular service, by all means. You may have certain reasons to choose one over the other. Uh, there were some other questions. Uh, yes? Yes, so databases are a unique scenario. Um, you could, in some cases, rely instead of, uh, I mean, the pattern that a lot of orgs will use is, you know, yes, as you say, rely on a database. But if you take that a step further and look at consuming, um, uh, for example, a cloud offering where it's a managed database and they handle scaling it to whatever capacity you need, or use the larger offerings from the clouds that give you nearly infinite database um, um, operations per second that could accommodate having one database be back here with your app that feeds all situations. That is one way you could accommodate that. That, um, that is not quite the same as, do, as having applications that are stateful. And that's, so that's, that's a differentiator. Stateful applications is insinuating that I deploy something on my Azure cluster, for example, and that singular app inst instantiation has its own persistent volume living in that cluster, which immediately deviates from the state of, of the same app in this cluster and this cluster. That is why you would need a replication layer for that data, for persistent volumes. Databases are the unique situation where you could sort of navigate around that. So that was, that was a good question, thank you. They're all good questions, frankly. <laughs> uh, any others, yeah. Yeah, so just for our example, Rosa was the first one. Uh, it could have very well been swapped in any which way you want. I could have had ARO been my first deployment, and then it was simply my choice because I've been, maybe ARO was my first cloud. And then I've chosen to make ARO, for example, my production environment, and then I started to do dev environments in, in uh, AWS, uh, in Rosa, and then I chose to expand those off to other clusters, right? Um, in some scenarios, people are doing um, not uh, large multi-tenant clusters, but they might be doing um, small clusters.
for a small set of apps, right? Each of those could have their own globally load balanced endpoint. Or you could get a really smart endpoint that gives you um, ways to divvy that up however you see fit. Any others? Uh, yeah. Do I have the YAML file for the action? I could probably get it, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. GitHub actions are really nice because it's very close to your source code. Infrastructure as code is a beautiful thing. Um, anyone who agrees that infrastructure, code, infrastructure as code is a beautiful thing? And if you've not figured it out yet, um, have a, read into it because the fact is, is that is another gateway to making this more possible. Uh, any other questions? Yes. They do both. I think it depends on like organizational structure. For things like this, I think having a, like advanced cluster manager that give you a single pane to see all the clusters is really helpful. But in some cases, some customers don't have that knowledge or haven't implemented those things. So it kind of depends. In, in our case, it's just easier to just have you know, each different cluster so that we can show you the different clusters. But it, kind of, it depends on what you want as the entry point. Uh, I'm just quickly throwing this up here because I promised marketing I would do this. Um, fact is, is there's a lot of benefit to doing, as you've seen, you know, proof of concepts for environments like this. Take advantage of the, of the fact that you can rejig subscriptions into consuming cloud services um, and see if this works for you, all right? And it turns out that with a 75% discount, I mean, that's, that's ridiculous. Are we allowed to have that much of a discount? <laughs> okay. Wow. This is for uh, ARO or Rosa. Yeah. Uh, I hope, I think that's it. Yeah, great. I hope you guys have enjoyed it, and uh, we'd be happy to talk afterwards if you wish. Have a great summit. Thank you.